Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Dan Lynch joins me. We're going to be talking about high-performance temporary storage using Crail. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Dan Lynch. Episode 458, recorded November 8th, 2017. Crail. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash floss. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open-source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be using every day and totally unaware of it, projects you might want to download right after the show and play with, and I'm going to have to work out a new opening eventually, but at least I like those words, so I keep using them over and over again. Welcome back, uh, Dan Lynch, back to the show as a co-host. Hey, it's good to be here. I like the opening words. I think they're very good. Well, and they, and they morphed over time. I mean, I kind of it, it's been really organic, but I kind of like that it covers just about all the scope of everything we've done. So it's a uh, it's kind of fun that way. But you know, if, I, I keep thinking every once in a while I want to rewrite that and make a different opening. But hey, it's organic. It's fine. It's good. It gets me on the show every day, and I already got it memorized. So that's kind of cool. So uh, where are you speaking to us from? Probably Liverpool, I guess, or something close to that. Yeah, I'm on the outskirts of Liverpool in my mountain layer. Um, it's not really a mountain layer. I wish it was, but um, yeah, I'm um, yeah on the in the northwest of of England. Um, sure, some people will know it. Very good. And I am back, as you can probably tell if you're watching the video, back in my Beaverton home uh, area. Uh, I'll be here for one more week, and then next week I'll be coming to you from beautiful downtown Santa Monica. But that is not until next week. So uh, this week we have an interesting project. Uh, I say that every time, actually, because they're all interesting projects. It's the Crail project, which, um, as they describe it, it's a storage platform for sharing performance-critical data in distributed data processing jobs at very high speed. And so in summary, it's basically access to data storage when you have high-performance data, high-bandwidth high data, uh, lots of cool things. I don't understand it entirely, but that's why we have experts coming on to talk about it in just a few minutes. That would be Patrick Studi. I'm probably going to mispronounce his name. Sorry, Patrick Studi. And Animesh Trivid. To Vidi, something like that. I'll let them correct me in a few minutes. But uh, so, um, so let me keep reading that paragraph because we'll give more idea here. So Crail is built entirely upon principles of user level I/O and specifically targets data center deployments with fast network and storage hardware, 100 gigabit per second RDMA, plenty of DRAM, um, NVMe flash, and all sorts of other terms that I have known nothing about. Which is part of the fun of doing this show is just discovering new things. And hopefully, somebody out there will go, "Oh, that's exactly what I needed." I'm glad that you brought these guys on the show. And apparently just recently, Crail has been voted in to become an Apache incubator project, which also puts it in pretty high significance as well. We'll have them talk about that when we uh, bring them on. Uh, uh, Dan, you want to take a whack at what you think this is about? Um, yeah, so I have done a bit of research today. I've got to be honest, it's a little bit outside my wheelhouse, if you like. Um, we usually call in Aaron for the for the for the data storage stuff, but um, yeah, I've been right. having a quick look at uh, distributed data storage, and uh, it seems to mainly be about speed and uh, speed of access, I suppose, and and processing and stuff. And I know a little bit about Hadoop. That's a very little bit. So um, <laughs> yeah, hopefully we we'll can find out more. That's why we're here. And it will also connect, I guess, to Spark, and so it's all, all written in Java, which, again, uh, not my mm -hmm. favorite language, but we'll talk about that probably a couple times as well. <laughs> if the answer is Java, you asked the wrong question, but anyway, well, that's kind of fun. <laughs> we'll bring the two guys on in just a second, but before that, I do have a very important message, because this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. The mortgage experience wasn't keeping up with the times. It was dated, and it needed a client-focused technological revolution. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. 
It's powerful. Whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds. Based on your income, assets, and credit, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all the home loan options for which you qualify and find the one that's just right for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash floss. That's rocketmortgage.com slash F-L-O-S-S. An equal housing lender, Licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support of Floss Weekly. Now let's go ahead and bring on our guests. Let's start first with Patrick Studi, and how did I do on pronouncing your name? No, that's correct. Yeah, Patrick Studi, I would say. It's a Swiss name. It's hard to pronounce in English. So. Okay, well, that's fine. Uh, and, uh, and where are you speaking to us from? Uh, I'm speaking to you guys from the IBM Research Lab here in Zurich, so from Switzerland. Ah, ah, well, you can go out and have chocolate afterwards, I guess. That would be kind of cool. Plenty of actually, uh, actually uh, we are just about a few hundred meters from the uh, uh, Linton Springley Chocolate Factory, one of the more famous ones. Ah. I guess you have those in uh, in the U.S. as well. Okay, great, great. And let's also go ahead and bring on Animesh Trevidi. How how do I do on that one? Uh, yes, exactly. That's hard to pronounce. Animesh Trevidi. So it's pretty close. Okay. Wow, wow. Well, lots of practice doing this show. I get to pronounce all sorts of fun things <laughs> all the time. So, And where are you speaking to us from? Um, also calling in from uh, IBM Research Lab in Zurich. So we are in the same building, just on a different floor. Cool, cool. So you can wave at each other. It's just, and all, you can go have some, some chocolate after the show, too. That would be pretty cool. Exactly. So let's start, That's the plan. <laughs> let, good, good, good. So let's start with Patrick. Give us the 30,000-foot view. What, what, are peop, what problem are people solving when they're reaching for Crail? Uh, yeah, so, well, let me just first say uh, in a nutshell what Crail is. So Crail is, as yeah. you said before, is a, is a distributed data store that is built uh, explicitly for high-performance storage and network hardware like RDMA networks or NVMe flash. I can talk a little bit more about the hardware later, but uh, for the moment, just think about you have a, a cluster and it, it, it basically runs uh, network and storage hardware that you would normally see in a supercomputer. And Crail is a storage platform that targets uh, mainly temporary data, storing of temporary data in analytics jobs. So, so like if you have a Spark uh, job running, uh, what you would typically do is you would read in some data from a persistent storage uh, uh, system like HDFS or, or an object store. And then uh, during the process of computing, um, lots of temporary data is generated. For an example is uh, shuffle data that is generated. There are plenty of other uh, uh, types of temporary data that is generated during a job, and at the end you would write down, uh, write out the result of that job. And Crail is basically uh, the storage platform you can use to store all that intermediate data effectively. But when we um, looked at the, the situation, uh, we found that the current way intermediate data is stored uh, could be improved. So uh, on the one hand side different frameworks like Spark or Hadoop, uh, uh, they all have different ways to store that uh, type of data. Uh, different mm -hmm. modules, like a, a shuffle module, will have a different way to store that data than, uh, let's say, uh, some broadcast module in Spark. So we found uh, it, it would be good to have a, a sort of a, a unified storage platform that can consume that type of data and that can that can give you the best performance on really fast hardware. Uh, that type of hardware I mentioned before, very fast networks, flash storage, plenty of DRAM and so on. If, if so I may let just me jump in. Go ahead, please, please. Yeah, so, so if I may just jump in, right? So kind of you can think of, uh, because you have you have must see in the poster, right? Where someone says the data center is my computer, right? So you can see the equivalent analogy that you're trying to read in and write out the data on a persistent storage, which is something like HDFS. And when the data is brought in, then it's processed in the DRAM, right? So the Crail store would be the equivalent analogy uh, of a DRAM in a distributed data center. So essentially, this is where you compute your results, you share it, you store it, you read and write. And once you're done with the processing, you can finally write the final output out on your persistent storage. And so this is distributed too. So it's not just a one machine talking to it. It's a lot. It's oh, always, I would say a, a, a bank of computers all working on the same uh, temporary data. Then, right? It, exactly. It's, it's it's meant to run on a distributed system. It's meant for the distributed data processing frameworks, and uh, it's meant to run in a big data centers. 
And and how did this project get started? Uh, uh, so, Patrick, you want to join? Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, when, when Animes and me, we both uh, joined IBM Research around, uh, I think, 2012, uh, around that mark, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, late, and at that time, late 11. Late 11, and uh, we basically joined a group that was uh, uh, working on uh, high performance networks in the context of supercomputers. Like they were uh, building parts of the, the blue gene supercomputer from, uh, or parts of the next generation blue gene supercomputers at that time. And mm -hmm. so, um, Animesh and we came in, we, we, have, we have more of the, the traditional data center, uh, data processing uh, background. So, uh, Hadoop map produce type of uh, uh, big data processing. So we were wondering if we could use some of these um, uh, fancy high performance networks in this context of some of these Apache projects, right? And uh, at the same time, these high speed networks became actually affordable. So you could buy an RDMA type of NIC for a reasonable price. And so we started to look into this and we figured that uh, it's very hard to leverage that type of hardware in a in these uh, Apache data processing systems. And uh, so we started to fiddle around a little bit and uh, um, uh, update some of the, the uh, made, made some, make some changes to some of these frameworks so that they can better use that type of hardware. But uh, very quickly, we figured that it needs a more uh, holistic approach. We, 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 we thought about, at that point, we thought about coming up with a new storage system that basically uh, allows you to to uh, effectively use uh, such uh, fast hardware and expose the, the performance to some of these Apache frameworks. Uh, can you give me an idea of the kinds of applications that require this kind of performance? Well, every application wouldn't mind running faster, would it? Sure, I understand that part, but I mean, like, what's the what's the real demand? I mean, I can run a lot of applications right on my laptop and I don't need all this performance for that. So what's the right, kind of right. thing that requires this kind of power? Right, right. I mean, if you look at analytics, uh, um, uh, the history of it, like it started uh, with basically a batch type of jobs. So MapReduce is a classical example of this. So you basically mm -hmm. run uh, batch operations on huge data sets, maybe overnight, and you wouldn't care about performance so much. But uh, soon, once this was possible, people actually got interested in actually uh, running queries on large data sets interactively. So you have maybe a uh, at the end of the chain, there might be a, a, a customer sitting that is trying to analyze large data sets. And at that point, it, it, it becomes evident that you can query these uh, large data sets in the matter of like maybe minutes or even better, in, in the order of seconds, sorry, in the order of seconds. So interactive queries on large data sets is really one key application that uh, would benefit from Cray. Now, is this something that I'd want to deploy on bare metal, or would it make sense to deploy it into VMs? Onimesh, you want to say something about that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So generally, uh, if you if you are after performance, right? So virtualization sure. is not uh, virtualization is not free, right? You do pay certain costs to when you are trying to virtualize the hardware and intercept the call and and uh, move the I.O. around, and especially high-performance I.O. is uh, costly in virtual machines, right? So if possible, the general recommendation is that if you can deploy it on a bare metal, that that's where you get the absolute best performance. And today, in the most of the data center and kind of hardware that you can buy, uh, it is possible to rent out uh, bare metal machines, right? So that would be one avenue of deployment. but. As I said, nothing stops uh, Crail from being deployed in uh, virtual machines, in containers, or any sort of deployment that you want to do, which is supported by the rest of the software stack and the hardware, it's possible. So, so uh, you may want to add also that, uh, like for instance, a lot of uh, some of the cloud operators today, they even though they give you yes. virtual machines, they have very effective ways to virtualize the, har the hardware. So uh, single root virtualization, for instance, single root IO virtualization, for instance, is uh, almost uh, uh, not adding any cost for IO operations. So you can actually run virtual machines uh, on top of such hardware uh, without paying a huge performance penalty. That sounds very cool. Um, I'm going to ask the question that I know Randall's dying to ask, which is, 
uh, this is all written in Java. And uh, can you give us some kind of reasoning for, for why you went with Java? Was that because you were trying to connect to things that were already written in Java and so on? So oh, sorry, I should have directed that. Sorry, yeah, yeah, I, I saw you both pro, looking right? at me like hoping the other one would take it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, does either, either of you want to chip in on that? So what's the benefits of, of, of having it in, in Java and so on? I think... So over the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years, I think in our group, we have written quite a bit of system software for high performance computing, right? And mm -hmm. uh, gradually we realized that every time we write uh, more and more software, right? And so there's a possibility to put the code out and make it reusable, right? And one of the success stories of these large scale uh, data processing systems and especially the Apache Foundation, is that they have built a very resilient and highly modular and reusable data processing stack that anyone can download and use, right? They can download here, download there, and put together your stack and run it on 1,000 machine in the data center today in a few clicks away, right? And part of this uh, uh, flexibility and usability that comes from uh, is, is, of course, from the community and as well as the quality of code and the uh, and uh, certain language features which are, which you get in uh, managed runtimes, right? So when we looked around and what we, what we see that what people are using today, right? And mm. we saw that at that time when we started, uh, Apache Hadoop was the de facto standard to process large amount of data. Uh, then came Apache Spark, there's a Flink, there's a whole bunch of ecosystem around. So if if, if we somehow, the goal becomes that if we, if we, if we were able to bring the benefits of our stack that we are developing into this ecosystem, then we immediately can benefit a large amount of developers which are out there. And that essentially become our goal. Mm. So- And, and are there, it, sorry, carry on. No, I'm just uh, just trying to wrap the thoughts that, uh, so there's, there's inherently nothing that stops implementing the same design in let's say C, C++ or uh, uh, any other languages which are out there. Uh, but just from the deployment and acceptance point of view, we found it easier to just do in Java and, and use the same um, guideline and uh, principle that people have already put out how to deploy these large scale software. I mean, I think you said it implicitly as well. Uh, the Apache uh, ecosystem is actually consists of large number of projects that are written in Java that have Java APIs and they would benefit from a storage system that at least has a Java API to uh, uh, so they can easily con consume uh, the data that they store in Crail. And at the same time, developing Crail in Java makes uh, Crail more platform independent. In fact, we are actually we are running Crail on uh, uh, several uh, platforms, uh, including IBM Power Machines, x86 machines. We run it on mainframes as well. And mm -hmm. some of that, I think, is, uh, is being made possible uh, by building it in a managed in a language that runs in a managed runtime. Mm. And, and are there uh, bindings available for other languages as well? Say, if I want to use, I don't know, something else. Um, not, currently. not current, not currently. Yes, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, as as we're starting to become an Apache project, I think that would be one of the goals uh, to mm. provide uh, uh, language binding for the multiple languages because we understand that not everyone is uh, super keen on running JVM and Java on every sort of devices which are out there. Mm. Excellent. So, I mean, if I'm, um, if if I was coming to, you know, I was going to start using Crayo when I wanted to develop and use it and so on. How would that look to to kind of the program? And what kind of calls do I need to make to it and and so on? Is it is it simple to kind of integrate if you like? So, uh, from the point of view of programming, um, so essentially this gives you an. Okay, how should I explain it? So at, at its core, right, it, it's, a, it's a distributed data store. So you instantiate the data store, you get a class. Uh, with the class, you can open uh, input and output streams, uh, but those are not Java streams. Those are special um, high-performance IO streams which are, uh, which are implemented using all the design principles uh, so that it's asynchronous, uh, there's a very smart buffer management internally, and essentially you just post your IO request, you get the response back, and that's essentially it as its core, right? And how do you use this fast and input and output? That up to you, right? 
Mm. At the same time, I, I think I, you wanted to say as well that we have, on top of Cradle, we have implemented, for instance, an HDFS adapter. So you can make look yeah. HDFS. You can make Cradle look like an HDFS uh, uh, um, namespace. Pause. So it, mm-hmm. it, it, you can use it transparently, for instance, in Spark or Hadoop to uh, store input data or intermediate data through the HDFS interface, if you like. The uh, HDFS interface is less powerful than the uh, uh, main Crail API, which has, as Animesh pointed out, all the asynchronous uh, APIs, etc., and uh, it mm-hmm. basically uh, exports the hardware features directly at the API level, so you can use uh, those features directly. But if you want to integrate it, the easiest way to integrate it is to use the HDFS adapter. Uh, you, there's some performance uh, cost at it, but that's how mm-hmm. you could do it. So, so yeah. there's a na- so, sorry, go on. I uh, just to wanted to run down the list, right? So there's a native file system interface, there's a HDFS adapter, there's a key value store. Uh, so generally speaking, you can think of Crail as a internal storage engine. And on top of that, you can build a different type of API, whatever suits your requirement. So how do you deal with um, redundancy and, and failover and all that kind of stuff? Uh, so, okay, so that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. That's one for you, Animesh. So, uh, you yes, <laughs> yes. So, uh, we, we have been answering that question for, for, for some time now. Um, mm-hmm. So, a short answer to that question would be that we don't. Um, because, the, because the chain of reasoning goes here is that uh, we understand that there's a requirement for redundancy and inter data, cent- data center deployment and fault tolerance and all these kind of things, right? And there are legitimate applications that require this type of deployment. Uh, but our hypothesis while building Crail is that a performance critical data, uh, which is only valuable for while you're running your query, right? And we are talking about interactive queries, so it will be probably a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes. That type of data does not require five way redundancy across the data center, right? And you think of this way, right? Often what you run on top of Crail, so like these distributed data processing systems like Hadoop or Spark, they themselves are fault tolerant. So what does that mean? So that means that let's say if if one of the process where they are executing and that crashes or a data node where they are storing data, that crashes, right? So they themselves can figure out exactly how to go back and how this data was computed, and they can recompute mm-hmm. that data. So, so we argue that if there's a failure in a Crail system and uh, the, the data processing framework which is running at the top figures out, oh, there's a failure, let me just go back and recalculate, right? If that takes like a couple of seconds, then there's no way for us to provide like five-way fault tolerant system underneath, right? So with that reasoning, the key objective of the Crail system becomes the performance. And, uh, but having said that, uh, we are trying to look into what is the most reasonable way we can provide uh, failure and fault tolerance in deployment without hampering the performance. But we have not come to a very concrete conclusion how to do this right while preserving the performance. So for now, we are focusing completely on the performance. Um, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I should just point—I feel like I'm asking loads of really difficult questions today, but I've got no idea how to deal with this. So don't, you know, <laughs> I've got no answers. So, uh, so don't worry about that. I, I know it's a really difficult question um, to deal with these kind of things. Um, so, uh, what's the what's the kind of the largest deployment you've seen, or the most interesting deployment that you've kind of seen or been involved with? Um, so, this is also a good question. So, the, the type of hardware we are looking at, right, uh, that uh, is typically not um, available uh, in um, regular data centers like in the Amazon cloud, and it's not so easy to run uh, experiments on that type of hardware at, at a scale of like hundreds or thousands of machines. But uh, uh, last year, we had access to a cluster that was about 128 nodes. That uh, cluster was actually uh, uh, running the uh, for, from a storage and network perspective uh, uh, the, the type of hardware Crail is designed for, and we have uh, some um, 
information on our website about the performance on that hardware. It's a 128 node, uh, 100 gigabit RDMA enabled cluster with plenty of flash in it and stuff. So how's the um, how's the addressing space look like to the uh, to the user? Um, uh, obviously, with HDFS, it looks like an HDFS file system. But when you use that lower level stuff, is it? Am I specifically talking to the RAM or disk or whatever it is that's backing this on a particular node when I'm addressing yeah. it, or is it somehow distributed automatically for me and balanced automatically for me? Yeah, so, 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 so let me try to explain first how it looks logically and then how it maps physically. So logically, Cray cool. provides a, a, hierarchical, a, a hierarchical namespace, so similar, similar to a file system, except that the uh, nodes in the hierarchy could be of different types. So we have um, uh, special types of uh, uh, files that uh, can be used. Let's say if you have a streaming workload, you can create a streaming type of file if you have um, uh, a shuffle workload, we have particular type of files that could be used for that type of workload and so on. So, and these files internally, they, 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 those are, they, they are logical entities and internally they are composed out of blocks like, uh, like in a file system. And the okay. blocks, it, the blocks themselves, they are distributed across the cluster and they could be stored on either DRAM or flash. So you may have a file or, yeah, you may have a file that, uh, is uh, initially having a few blocks in it in DRAM of, of some of the cluster nodes, and uh, once the DRAM runs out, uh, the the file uh, writing will continue writing blocks in Flash. Okay. So logically, okay. it's a hierarchical namespace, and uh, in the back of the hood, uh, the blocks are being physically distributed across the cluster on different uh, storage media. But can I uh, assign an affiliation? So I, if I know I'm going to use the data on a particular one of my computing nodes, would I, could I say, be sure to store this near there? Right, 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 exactly. So this is part of the API, so you can uh, express some of your affinities. You prefer this particular file to be backed with Flash, or you want this file to be backed with DRAM, or you want the blocks of this file preferably to be stored uh, in, on, on this set of machines, etc. So that's very important uh, in some applications that you can control uh, the, the the media and the location of, of your data. Okay, and before we lose all of our audience and, and heavily geeky things, I do want to also talk about the community. So what does it mean first to be a part of the Apache Incubator uh, framework? Onimish, you're, you're, you want to say something about it? the Apache Incubator. So, um, um, Sure. Um, I think... Um, as I said, right from the very beginning, we did realize that uh, that's that's the community that we want to target, right? That's because they are building the high quality software that everyone is using. And for us, in order to get uh, wide scale acceptance, it became very clear that we have to get into this Apache community, right? And so from the very beginning, when we started the Crail project, right? So we, we, we chose the right set of licenses, we chose the right set of uh, coding practices, how it's, the system is developed, how is it deployed, how is it tested. Uh, we followed all the open source standards that's out, out there, right? And uh, for us, I think it is it is a really big deal to get into Apache, uh, into the Krail incubation state. And I think uh, that will that will give us really uh, the exposure that we are looking for and the wide user base to for for different users to try out Krail in their deployments. Would it be fair to say that most of the commits up to this point have come from inside IBM? Uh, up to a certain extent, yes. Uh, but we do have a committer which are from outside IBM as well. So you actually are building up a community and actually getting people playing with this, using it, and providing um, uh, quality updates. Uh, exactly, precisely. So we have requests for features time to time, and then we discuss exactly how can we implement it. Is it too intrusive or not? And uh, we have we have lots of users. Uh, first of all, obviously, as you said, right, this is uh, not the common hardware software combination that you typically find. So as you get started with these hardware, you obviously run into some of the pitfalls that, oh, this doesn't work, what do I do? And that doesn't work, what do I do? What does it mean for this type of feature? So we also provide a lot of help. We have an internal mailing list, um, and gradually we will move the traffic from there to the Apache mailing list, um, where we provide help to set up these devices and run Krail and see the performance by yourself firsthand, right? So cool. that's a part of the... 
that's a part of the goal that uh, we are trying to engage universities and different uh, other firms and all the Apache um, community member in order to um, you know get involved and build the system. And as part of being an Apache incubator project, you're also slowly moving the governance of this to something outside of IBM as well, right? Uh, yes, uh, naturally, yes. Um, so the idea is to, uh, we already are in uh, open source. I think it's not a closed source project, even though it started from here, but uh, we very quickly made it open source and we already are inviting uh, members to contribute there. And uh, and after that, of course, so as you said, right, it, it will become the kind of repeated progress reports, uh, updates, and how we are engaged in the community, and all those kind of things become um, more important. And uh, does it have to be now under the Apache license, or was it like that from the beginning? It was there from the beginning, yes. It's a little bit of foresight when you started this thing. You kind of knew that it was going to head this direction. That's cool. Um, right. I how, think that... Sorry, I was just saying that because that becomes because when you start building something like this, right, you yourself start using components which are from Apache, right? And you could not have built something like this uh, if, if it was not for those components, right? So you do realize uh, that it, it is helpful uh, for the community if you also build something which you can contribute back under the same terms and conditions. So what's the, what, is this production ready now? Is this, has this already been used in, in real applications? Um, it's production ready. That depends upon how, what you, what you call production ready, right? So, uh, it, it has been tested very extensively as Patrick mentioned, right? We have run on X86, we have run on power, uh, we have run on system Z, um, we have run up to 128 node large scale cluster. We have sorted, uh, multiple workloads, multiple frameworks. So it has tested extensively in that manner. Uh, what we are focusing on right now is to um, make it accessible as well, right? So as I said, right, it, it exposes certain hardware features, certain um, advanced features, which are, once you start using that, right, so you become dependent upon the system and echo uh, and the environment around you, right? So if something goes wrong, then there should be some sort of automated service that tells you helpfully, oh, by the way, please check this thing and set this thing to this, right? That's why your system is crashing. So so in terms of usability and how it is deployed, that's where we are trying to improve and make it much more accessible to the public so that you can just click download ready and just deploy it on X number of cluster that you have. So we already have a deployment mode, which is very similar to the rest of the services that you can get from Apache, like uh, HDFS or Yarn or Zookeeper, if you start a server and you start a bunch of um, um, uh, worker servers. And apart from that, we have Ansible scripts. Uh, we are trying to integrate this in Ambari. And uh, beyond that, we are trying to build container and VM images that anyone can just download and try it out in their cloud infrastructure if they like. So we're trying to improve uh, the usability and uh, and accessibility part of the Crail as well. Hmm. Excellent. I was actually just about to ask you about deployment, so you, you've you've preempted me there. <laughs> as well done. Um, uh, so, sorry. No, no, that's, no, that's good. That's good. Um, so yeah, I, I suppose. I was going to ask actually. You mentioned about it's good to deploy onto bare metal. That's kind of your, you know, that's the best for performance, which which makes sense. Um, so does this come as like an installable um, as part of like a, a distribution, like say a Linux distribution? I could just install packages onto it. How would I actually go about deploying it? If you know what I mean. So the way currently it is packaged that uh, you download a jar from the web, right, and it has certain mm -hmm. deployment scripts with it. Uh, the kind of configuration you have to do because it assumes that you have a high performance network and storage uh, that you have to configure explicitly outside the Crail, right? So for any of the program that want to use the RDMA networks or high performance NVMe flash, you have to configure those devices. That's not certain. Mm -hmm. That's not something which is specific to Crail. Once you have those devices set up, right, you just download the jar. There is a kind of a configuration file you have to save which are the machines, which are the IP, which are the host name, what is the network interface, what is the block device that we that you want Krill to use. And from there on, just, just start. From there, it just takes over. And uh, from services up, we can do LS. You'll see the file. You can copy from local file system. You can copy out to local file system. You can start a Spark. You can tell, hey, Krill is running at this address, at this port. Please pick it up. From there, it will pick it up. 
And it, it, would I manipulate like an XML config file or something just to set all that? You mentioned a config file. I'm assuming it, it's just oh. like a simple XML or something. No. <laughs> we uh, gave up okay. on XML. Okay, I assumed wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we, we, we gave up on XML. In the beginning, yes, we started with XML because that seemed to be kind of a de facto standard, but uh, it was just painful to modify and manipulate. Um, I think we quickly moved to a certain just a key value pair type of thing, strings, and that's about it. Um, no fancy XML configuration. No, well, that's really interesting, yeah. Yeah, Sorry, no, I, was, I, I wasn't. Didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, carry on. No, no, just so it was just painful. I think <laughs> uh, for mm. even for us to modify and deploy it quickly. <laughs> Oftentimes you yeah. run into typo, and then you go. Yeah. So, um, what? Um, I mean, we talked a little bit about. Randall was asking about kind of moving um, to, um, you know, moving some of the governance outside of IBM and stuff. What's the the kind of developer community like? Have, have people responded well to? Um, to Crail, you know, when you go to conferences and things, that people excited about it. Uh, Patrick, you want to say a few things? I think you have been traveling the last six, eight months, right, to lots of venues. That's definitely uh, taking too far. So, uh, well, we have been presenting uh, Crail at the um, Apache uh, at, the, at the Spark Summit. So that's a get together of like all the developers uh, and, and and users of Spark and. Uh, the typical um, feedback we get is that, again, most people don't have that type of hardware sitting around. But the, the idea with Crail is actually that the hardware is going to come. Uh, mm. You can see actually on, a, on, a, on Amazon, right? So in terms of flash storage, they, they have uh, NVMe flash in as, an, as, a one, as their offering, as part of their offering. So, so uh, that's uh, one type of uh, storage hardware we explicitly support. So. Right now, it's still a little bit a gap between the hardware people have and the hardware Crail is, is designed for. But we believe mm -hmm. that in the future, uh, we will see more and more uh, of that type of hardware in the, inside the data centers and inside the clusters people uh, uh, operate. And uh, uh, we hope that the interest for Crail is going to, uh, to increase uh, in, in, in near future, actually. I think one interesting Thanks. point to, sorry. One interesting mm -hmm. point that to add there is that it's it's the availability of hardware is not the only thing which is, is stopping, right? So if you look at the bigger picture, right, you will see that uh, the the CPU uh, improvements that if you see last 15 or 20 years, right? So you see that back in 90s, there was this uh, clock frequency type of thing that CPU performance improved from few megahertz to three and four gigahertz, right? And the last few years, that thing has flattened out. But at the same time, you see that IO devices and the kind of hardware around it, right? You started to see FPGA, GPUs, uh, fast storage, high performance network, which can just do a whole lot more than just sending and receiving packets, right? So these kind of devices, which are now started to appear in the general commodity computing inside the data center and gradually on the rest of the system where it's processed. So there is a need to leverage these kind of hardware in your data processing framework, right? So Crail, you can think of as a first step towards where we integrate these devices, which is already out there as a first class citizen, especially in networking and storage, and give the performance of these devices, which is in a couple of microsecond latencies, 100 plus gigabit bandwidth, right, uh, in, in mm. Java. And that's a kind of performance suddenly became available to the Java developers. So now the question is, what do we do about it, right? So that's the next step where we are at as well. Mm. And, and it, it's tough trying to stay ahead of the curve. It sounds like you, you're planning very much with the future in mind, which is obviously a good idea. I mean, that sounds so silly to say, but it's so obvious. But but you know what I mean? Um, you know, the, there is a lot of stuff on the horizon. So there's a lot of effort gone into this. Is the hardware at the moment, are you seeing big benefits at the moment? You mentioned 100, 100 gigabit bandwidth and so on. Are you seeing big benefits at the moment or is the hardware still catching up a little bit? So it's a, it's okay. So it's a two-part answer to this question, right? So the first part is about the hardware. So hardware, uh, in the last five years or so, what we have seen that hardware has become gradually more accessible to a lot of people. Everyone is trying out RDMA. Everyone is trying out and um, NVMe flash, right? And those provide essentially an order of magnitude performance improvement what you generally get with the uh, commodity hardware, right? So it, it's getting there. And the second part of the whole thing is a bit more subtle, right? So uh, it's 
so usually if you're a data center operator and you're running a workload, right, and you said you decided to upgrade your networking from 10 gig to 100 gig, so you expect all the workloads which are running your data center, they will suddenly will see 10x performance improvement, right? It's natural. They are upgrading hardware. Things should get faster, right? But mm. that's not what we have seen. And I think um, there are also other independent studies which have pointed out the same problem, uh, is that even though you can think of the whole data processing stack as a kind of a stack layer, right? At the very bottom, you are improving the high-end hardware you're putting at the very bottom, right? But the rest of the software stack that we have built over the last 15 and 20 years, that's not ready for this kind of performance, right? So only a fraction of this performance from the bottom trickle ups all the way to the top, right? So, uh, so when you put this high-end hardware, you only see a very fraction of this performance at the very top for your workload, right? So this is also the thing that we are trying to improve with Grail, that gradually we are moving this performance, which is only available at the hardware. The next step becomes a user space. A step after it's become mm. JVM, after that becomes its distributed systems, right? And then becomes the uh, data processing frameworks, whatever you're using, Spark and Hadoop. So we're gradually trying to push this performance through the rest of the stack. And mm. so far in our experiments, we have found gains in order of, uh, let's say, um, uh, two to six X or eight X performance improvements, right? So part of, it depends upon the workload, depends upon the data. Uh, we are we have written a series of blog posts on the website. Uh, people should check it out, and there we analyze exactly what performance you get, and if you don't get certain performance, why don't you get a certain performance, and what could we improve about it, right? So mm. it's it's an ongoing process. But as we pointed out, the goal is actually if you uh, if you see if if you put a fast hardware, you should see fast workload, right? Fast fast workload mm. performance. There's no doubt about that part. There's no debate about that part. Yeah, I, I was reading on your website before about how you can configure Crail to, um, you mentioned you, you, if you're putting in high performance hardware and so on, you can configure with um, a setup where you would say prioritize, uh, this is my you know layman's language, yes. I suppose, but you would tell it to prioritize the high performance uh, hardware first. So you would say, use all your fast memory, et cetera, then you know, on all the nodes and then look yes. at slower stuff. So that's yeah. quite cool. Yeah, that's actually uh, an interesting aspect you, you're pointing out here. So, one outcome of network of the network infrastructure uh, becoming faster, like uh, not only in terms of throughput but also in terms of latency, is that it sort of changes uh, the the cost of accessing remote data. Right in the past, like the traditional uh, MapReduce Hadoop type of frameworks, they were designed to avoid networking at all costs. So, uh, what does that mean? They, they they basically uh, assume that the data is distributed across the network, across the cluster, and then they use a scheduler that would ship the computation to the nodes that have the data locally available to avoid uh, fetching the data over the network. And with the new type of hardware, especially with new type of uh, networks, it's now comparably cheap to access remote data. So you can change some of these principles, and this is what we do in Crail. For instance, we are um, trying to uh, leverage uh, uh, the to use the the storage space uh, uh, in a way that is uh, agnostic to whether the data is local or remote. But we prioritize more whether the data is on is on DRAM or or in flash, right? So that's really the the differentiator here. So uh, accessing data from a remote from a remote DRM is definitely faster than accessing data from from local flash. Mm. Uh, we've actually got a, a question from uh, our, uh, our our co-host who's who's uh, who's, high, who's around, who's watching and listening. Uh, Jonathan Bennett, who's here uh, very often, um, he's he's got a question in IRC, which I'm going to um, I'm going to pinch. He was asking about security and how do you approach um, securing like your Crail instances? And also you mentioned, you know, you're shipping data, distributed data and so on. Is, how do you approach kind of securing those data streams, if you like? So security is, is, is actually something we haven't addressed in Crail at all, I have to say. And there's a reason for it. So we basically, most of the, the uh, environments we, we, we look at, they are kind of closed environments. So you run your uh, uh, Spark uh, deployment on either on premise on your own set of nodes that you control, or you run them on your own 
uh, part of your uh, data center in the cloud that has uh, that comes with security features on its own. So there's no explicit security features in Cray, I'll have to say at that point. Mm -hmm. Well, generally, it's not really needed because you're, if you're running especially on dedicated hardware, you own the whole machine, so it really doesn't matter. But um, you probably also own VPCs between your, uh, your various systems, too, which can be secured at their own level at the, the lower level. So it's probably not a, a big issue, and I can see why you haven't addressed it yet. It doesn't, that's not really important. What's important is getting the data to go fast, and fast is often doesn't mean mm -hmm. secure. It's just sort of against each other. Um, <laughs> We're almost out of time, but a couple of things I wanted to make sure we covered before we uh, before we have to let you go. And one of the things I I'm curious about is what's still missing to make this, because you were sort of hedged on production ready. Uh, what's still missing in this, and what's on the roadmap? Well, as, as Animesh has pointed out previously, one big pile of work we're currently putting in is on making things more usable. So the, the user friendliness of the system is currently a, a top priority for us. Uh, at the same time, hardware is very, uh, uh, the hardware world is, is not sleeping. There is constantly new types of hardware that is coming out uh, that we are uh, looking to integrate. So Crail is essentially a modular storage system that allows you to integrate new type of hardware uh, as it comes up. So we are currently looking at integrating cheap use uh, into Crail and uh, uh, other type of uh, network APIs like DPDK, uh, which is an API, uh, a user level API that is different from RDMA, but uh, maybe more easily, more easy to use in the cloud. So we are we are working on making the user friendliness a bit better, and uh, also on integrating new type of hardware. And I presume you need uh, help with internationalization and uh, translation. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I also had, I was curious about uh, the use of Java, and I know there's you know there's a lot of history with Java going faster and faster. But have you ever seen Java be part of the bottleneck of this? Um, yes, uh, Mr. Well, it's more often than not, right? So, uh, so that's one of the pain points that we repeatedly, whenever we are doing performance analysis, we do see. Um, things which are Java specific, right? So uh, object management, garbage collection, serialization, deserialization, uh, these are the top suspects every time we start doing performance analysis for any of these workloads, right? And, uh, and we have a long list of things that we would like to see improved in, uh, not necessarily just Java, but let's say managed runtimes, right? So it could include Java, Scala is another one that runs in JVM, right? So. So definitely at a point, uh, we are at the point and the kind of performance we are talking, right? So these kind of things becomes, I, I give you another example, right? So it often happens that uh, we run a workload, it, it runs, let's say for X seconds. We run it second times, it runs for uh, like 30% faster, right? Because by that time, JVM is hot, the instructions are jitted and they are running natively. And but the first time, if you are doing I/O at that speed, right? So the interpretation of the code becomes a bottleneck, right? So, so these kind of overhead also comes into play when you are talking about the scale of microseconds, right? A couple of microseconds. So definitely, that's something we would like to see improved in the JVM development and Java development. I also cool. want to and add. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so, so, sorry, I don't know if you have more time at all. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're fine. Go. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the question also has to be looked. Uh, there is trouble overheads coming in at the top level workload level, uh, but very little trouble overheads actually at the Cray level. So Cray as a storage system actually delivers performance at the speed of the underlying hardware in most of the cases. So we can actually uh, read and write uh, data into Cray uh, at the speed of 100 gigabits if the data is stored in DRM in a distributed fashion. Uh, and we can access data in, uh, in the order of a few microseconds. That's uh, only a few microseconds more typically than the raw network latencies. But at the workload level, if you run a compute engine on top of Crail, there is typically uh, 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 overheads coming in as part of the computation, right? Which is uh, having more of the job overhead uh, involved. Then in the in the I/O, the I/O we do in Crail is is as as we discussed before is user level I/O. So we are basically talking to the hardware directly, um, 
bypassing a lot of the JVM and uh, the operating system. So you don't see a lot of Java overheads at the Cray level, but at the workload level, yes, there are uh, sometimes uh, quite substantial overheads coming from the, the managed runtime. I think one of the fun facts that we have observed in our analysis is that actually um, CPU is the new performance bottleneck, not the I.O. hardware that often think people think, you know, I.O. is the bottleneck. No, I think if you put the fast I.O., I think more often than not, CPU is the new performance bottleneck, especially for these kind of workloads. So we'll have to work out better ways to use uh, more cores at once and things like that. So hopefully we can uh, get that going a little bit uh, faster as well. So it's, well, there's always going to be a bottleneck, right? So always going to be something in the chain is going to be the thing that, that gates Absolutely. the total overall performance. So uh, now we're just seeing it thanks to you guys' work. We're seeing it move away from the uh, I.O. part and back into the CPU side. So hopefully the CPU guys will get smarter again, too. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I, like I said, we're almost out of time. One other question I want to make sure gets asked is, did we leave anything out? Is there anything you want to make sure our audience is aware of before we have to let you go? Hmm. It's a tough question, I know, always, because you have to think back, what did we talk about? And is a subset of what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> it's a tough question, sorry. Anyway, uh, if you think of anything. No, I think that pretty much covers the um, essence of what we are trying to build and what where we are targeting and what we'd like to see in future, I think. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. So two final questions that uh, my audience gets mad at if I don't ask, uh, and this is for either, both of you, uh, one at a time, of course. Um, what's your uh, what text editor do you spend all day in, and uh, what's your favorite scripting language, Patrick? Uh, so, uh, well, I'm I'm mostly developing in uh, Eclipse, um, yeah. and uh, scripting language. I have to say, I'm I'm, I'm really. Uh, very poor in scripting. I know, I know you you hate to hear that, but uh, <laughs> uh, 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 that's definitely not one of my uh, core skills. So uh, Animesh is doing much better in scripting. I have to say. Okay, Animesh, uh, same question. Um, um, I'm using uh, IntelliJ IDEA for the Java Scala okay. development, and for mm -hmm. scripting, I think it's a split between. Um, I have to say, I'm 80% Bash guy and 20% mm -hmm. anything else that I can do. So that includes Python. Uh, more often than not, and uh, yeah, I think those two covers most of my requirement. But most of okay, eighty percent is Bosch. Fair answer for both of those. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you guys for coming on to talk about uh, Crail today. Um, uh, definitely a lot more exposure to it now than you had uh, an hour ago, so that's good. <laughs> it's always handy to be able to get to, on, a, on a platform like this. So thank you guys for coming on to talk about Crail. Yeah, thanks for having thanks. us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Very good. That was Patrick Studi and Animesh Trevidi uh, talking to us about Crail. What do you think there, uh, uh, Dan? Yeah, really, really interesting stuff. Um, it's all um, obviously everything with the the kind of development of, of networks. Now we moved away from the mainframe kind of server client thing, and now the internet's become so good that we're all distributing everything again and and kind of doing remote computing and stuff. And it it seems like this I/O problem. It has been a a slight bottleneck and as you said we're going back to the bottleneck being the cpu again now so you know i guess it's almost like a game of tennis it's kind of like we've sorted the io you know you sort out the cpu and then it'll come back again but um yeah it looks like they're doing some really, really interesting stuff and i uh, i'll be interested to see what comes in the future absolutely absolutely and uh, uh again it's just um this actually was a slightly less buzzword worthy show than i thought it was going to be so these guys <laughs> um, obviously were talking more technical than anything but and there were quite a few terms that I don't understand, but I sort of just figured some of our audience would probably figure it out. But anyway, so the, yeah, this is a, a fascinating project. Glad they got to be part of the patch incubator. That means it's going to get a lot more exposure, mm -hmm. a lot more um, support, all that stuff going on. So uh, yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Anything else before I run down the upcoming guests? Uh, no, I don't think so. I guess we just have to to keep an eye on it and, and see how, uh, how Crail develops. It seems like it's got off to a great start. Absolutely. And I don't remember how I got this show. I think uh, the, their PR person contacted me or something, but somehow a lot of that happens for a lot of these shows now. I get um, I'm, I'm, uh, Floss Weekly is famous enough now that I get probably a request from a PR person about every three weeks now. So this is, um, it uh, proves mm. I'm serious press now, which is really fun. Anyway, so speaking of upcoming guests, um, Offnet next week, that's going to be fun. So at Offnet, uh, a guy in Zimbabwe working for an ISP in Zimbabwe contacted me and said that the uh, almost everybody has cell phones there now, which is sort of weird that Zimbabwe people would be carrying around cell phones, but their data network is extremely slow. But So what he's uh, come up with as an idea is to provide Wi-Fi hotspots 
uh, with a, a, a shared data connection to to uh, you know the, the ISP, uh, but providing local content. So let's say you go into a restaurant and uh, their menu would be on your phone. You could see it on your phone and maybe even order and things like that. So there's a local content being provided for it and it still passes through to be a Wi-Fi hotspot to help people that are hanging out at the restaurant. So I'm really looking forward to that. It's also gonna be our first call we've ever made, I think, to Zimbabwe. Uh, on Skype. So uh, we're praying that the Skype gods are okay next week. Hey, I asked him, do you have enough bandwidth? And he goes, I work for an ISP. This is not going to be a problem. So we'll see. We'll see how this actually works out. So uh, again, crossing my fingers, praying to the Skype gods for next week. Following that immediately, also the week following, this thing I'm really looking forward to, JewelBots. I saw this at allthingsopen.org. This woman, uh, unfortunately her name is somewhere else, um, it creates these friendship bracelets based on uh, um, uh, uh, Arduino platform. And teenage and preteen girls are programming these things in C++ to code in, to have it so like, uh, they have they have Bluetooth connectivity. They also have um, LEDs that can glow uh, infinite colors. And so they have the, the people build applications like when my friend is around, both of our bracelets will glow blue at the same time. Way cool stuff. I was just so mm-hmm. motivated as a way to get more people, more especially you know people who are traditionally not going to the STEM areas, to actually get them involved. So it's a, uh, they, on the website it says guys can use it too, but we're really sort of aiming at the girl market, which is kind of weird. But anyway, so she's going to come on and talk about that. Uh, following that, Dell, they have an umbrella uh, under curly brace code, closed curly brace, which is really hard to Google for, uh, for a bunch of projects that they want to talk about in terms of their open source involvement and support. Uh, Suze, I can't believe we haven't done Suze yet. We've had a couple of people who were part of the Suze project on the show, but never Suze itself as a distribution, one of the oldest and most well-known distributions out there. So we're going to talk to uh, somebody, a uh, key representative from them. And wrapping up the year so far, we have Linkerd, which is a transparent proxy that adds service discovery, routing, and failure hand- handoff um, all automatically for that. Uh, I'm going to start opening up Q1, going to start booking some uh, some um, guests for that and I'll probably go through my mailing list and figure out who I haven't talked to in a while and uh, get some more uh, fillings on that. So you'll hear about that here uh, next week at the end of the show. If I get any success coming in the next couple weeks, if you have any um, other suggestions for things you haven't heard yet on this show, or maybe even we've we've had a few shows where we brought back people from like five, ten years later. So uh, if you have a, one of those, one of your favorite shows was three or four years ago, we'll revisit them if you want. So uh, just let me know. So uh, if you have other suggestions, again, please have the project leader or the community coordinator email me. That's the quickest way to get them on to the, uh, the big spreadsheet. Big spreadsheet can be found at twit.tv slash floss. Uh, that's the homepage for this show. And from there, you can drill down and see who are our upcoming guests and see what we've got going on. We have a live stream. We took a couple questions from it. Uh, actually, I'll just only from uh, Jonathan Bennett, our, mm-hmm. our, our frequent co-host there. Um, it's at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays at live.twit.tv. Now, the, the U.S. just switched back from daylight savings time. So that's now at uh, UTC minus 8 again rather than UTC minus 7 like it was all summer. Uh, you can follow us at Floss Weekly on Google+, Plus, uh, at Floss Weekly on Twitter automatically tweets over to follow me at uh, Randall L. Schwartz at Google Plus and that tweets automatically over to at Merlin M-E-R-L-Y-N I don't really have anything to plug except I'm going to be in a cruise in January so I'll probably have, a, have to find a round of host and co-host again while I'm on that cruise um, anything you want to plug Dan? Yeah you mentioned um, when you talked about the bracelets there and the Arduino projects and stuff um, I, w- I would just encourage people to find out where your nearest uh, hacker space is or maker space and if, and you can go along and find out more. Um, I I'm involved with a space in Liverpool called Does Liverpool, and uh, they run mm-hmm. a thing called Maker Night where people can go along every Thursday night and and start putting together Arduinos and and Raspberry Pis and lots of other things. As you can tell, I'm not the most knowledgeable person there. That's not surprising. Uh, but um, yeah, it's really good. So you can just Google it. Have a look for Maker Night. If you want to find anything about myself, you can go to danlynch.org, and uh, you can find all of my stuff there. And Dan, it's great to have you back, uh, at least as an infrequent but uh, occasional co-host, especially coming mm. forward for this show because we're almost out of people again. So uh, I do have also, <laughs> I just want to say, on that Jewelbot show, uh, Aaron has already agreed to be on that show because, uh, and Aaron being a big maker guy, so I, I'm glad that we got him mm. for that show coming up. So that's coming up in uh, two weeks, I think it is. So so Dan, like I said, thank you. Thank you once again for taking the uh, co-chair and, uh, and uh, helping me out today. Appreciate it. No problem. I'll see you again soon. I'm sure you will, and we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly.